do would denazification efforts apply to today, like with Donald Trump fans? And the answer is some of them, some of them. But it really takes an organized effort. So I want to talk about what it would take to deprogram Trump supporters, how the allies did it after World War II, deprogrammed a massive cult of personality. Anyway, like deprogramming the religion and deprogramming the political realm were kind of two different efforts. The denazification thing is super interesting to me because it, it, it very much applies to our world today. You know, like what are we how do we apply these denazification efforts to what we've got going on today? You know, because honestly, support for Donald Trump right now is exactly where support for Hitler was at its height. It, well, where it was in. Yeah, at its height, I'd say. It's exactly where it was. Same percentages, roughly. At the end of the war, everybody was like ashamed to be a Nazi. They were embarrassed by it. They didn't want to like make it public. But the allies, after taking control, they assigned different zones to like different allies. So Russia had a denazification zone. Uh, the UK did. France did. Britain. I'm sorry. France did. The United States did. They all had different. Uh, denazification zones and denazification efforts were very different across the zones the united states was really strict about their denazification efforts for the church specifically um britain and france were way more kind of lackadaisical if you will about their denazification efforts with the church and Russia's denazification efforts were interesting. It was an interesting choice. I'm not sure I would have gone with this if I had been in charge. Russia's denazification efforts basically involved um, the men in the head and the women, and that was it. And, and, and when there's protest over doing that, drive tanks into the town square and just run over thousands of people with the tanks. Really, that was the denazification effort. I guess that's one method, yeah. It was ugly. It was real ugly. I mean, it was bad, real bad. And I just devoted like a couple paragraphs to it because I don't want to go into, you know, I, I, I want this to be like a, an interesting psychological um, evaluation, not something that like scars you walking out of it. So I was raised in the, the former British zone. Oh, that's interesting. So West Germany. OK. Anyway, yeah. Um, so the denazification efforts in the church were very different across different zones. Um, of course, Russia was nationally atheist and communist, so there was no religion there. I don't. They didn't stop religion from taking place. I just. I don't think that they cared. I think that they were there to like honestly, just to like rip and pillage. And when that was, you know, when the fun from that kind of wore off. They were like, all right, I'm done. In 1952, Russia tried to form a democratic, like, republic out of Germany. They tried to, you know, join the two halves again in 1952. They're like, wow, this is no fun anymore. We've done it all. And the U.S. basically said no, because they were too distracted by other things. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Point that I'm getting to here is that Russia was just like, just like amoral it was worse or just as bad to have russia over nazis over top of you there was no improvement effectively it was really really ugly real ugly the allies drew up lists of german christians which is the reich church members german christians were the the nazi christians basically that's what they called themselves it was a deutsche christian or something like that anyway they drew up lists of like Nazis that needed to be purged from positions of authority, and fifteen percent of the um, Christian, the Protestant Church, was on the list. So that should give you an idea of roughly like how many people there were involved in this whole thing. In some cases, there were Nazis that were at the top of their churches that were very popular with their congregations, and when the United States removed them from authority, there was outrage, outrage over it. Their congregation lost their shit and said, you're Nazifying us. You're making this worse. You want to denazify us, then put our pastor back, basically. 
And I believe that in that one specific case, the United States said, suck eggs, it's not happening. One unfortunate side effect of denazification efforts was that, with the church specifically, I mean, when the German Christians, the Nazis, started coming back, like the pastors came back from the war, and, were, and, and they started getting punished for like their behavior, the punishment was to demote them to basically like um, hospital chaplain instead of like head of a, um, a thousand person church or whatever. Churches were gigantic back then. Oh my God, they were huge. The average church was like 800 people or something. I don't remember what the number is, but they start demoting them to like hospital chaplain or um, prison chaplain or whatever. But that's the role that women filled before the war. Additionally, when the men came back from the war, they took their roles over again as um, or the ordained ministers of the churches. When the men were gone, they had to, the women had to take over ordination and like catechism and whatever other shit, you know, um, ministers do, whatever it is. They had to take over those roles fully, and they were fully approved, emergency approved, to do so. But now the women are pushed out of their roles as pastors, and they're also pushed out of their roles as what they were previously, which is hospital chaplains. So they, they, they completely pushed women out entirely. And as Victoria Barnett points out in her book, For the Soul of the People, how did she frame it? It was really good. It was easier for people to forget German Christian wrongs than to give women rights. I thought that was just really well worded. I, I appreciate that very much. Anyway, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff to this. They created courts called Spruchkammer, uh, I think. No. Anyway, these courts, the Spruchkammer courts or whatever, I'll pronounce it like an American, were basically courts where they would call suspected Nazis up and make them defend themselves. Like, if you were on the list of people from the Nazi party, you had to show up to this court and prove that you're not a Nazi, basically, flipping the burden of proof. And therein lies the interesting part. Hang on. The, the CH is fricative. I love that word, fricative. I've never heard that. Fricative CH. Is that k like that? K k sp so Spruchkammer or Spruchkammer. Is that it? Here's the interesting part about denazification efforts, okay? This is a point that I make in the book. You can't reason somebody out of something that they didn't reason their way into. And these people were required to accept Nazi ideology or shut their fucking mouths, one or the other. Most people who believed in Nazi ideology were either brainwashed into it or n none of them were talked into it through reason. It wasn't a rational, reasonable kind of belief system is the point here. So anyway, um, in the book, I point out that unfortunately, you have to remove people's rights. You have to, to deprogram Nazism from an entire generation of people. There's no other choice. Um, you have to burn their books. You have to ban the Nazi flag and force them at gunpoint to sit in front of a TV and watch what the Nazis did at these camps. There's no other way to make this work but, but through force, unfortunately. Anyway, like deprogramming the religion and deprogramming the political realm were kind of two different efforts. Um, let's see. One, like, a, a lot of the things that are listed in this, this book are, like, pitfalls that the Allies ran into along the way. Like, how do we deprogram people with the maximum effect? One of the pitfalls, some of them weren't pitfalls, some of them were justifications, um, but one of the listed complaints was that denazification efforts led to denial. That was one of the big problems. Uh, people denied their involvement in the Nazi party because, A, they were afraid of what would happen if they admitted to it, and B, they were ashamed. So one of the big problems is that people felt like they, you know, they, they were denying it. I don't know how to fix that, though. People, are, people should feel ashamed of what they did and how they felt, and they should want to deny it, 
right? So I don't even view that as a pitfall. But one of the tactics used for denazification was something called Purcell shine letters. Purcell was the name of the laundry detergent used at the time. And the idea is that you can get a letter from one of the victims of Nazi oppression. As a Nazi, you can ask somebody to write a letter for you, exonerating you from wrongdoing. And the letters are called Purcell shine letters. And you bring them to these Spruchammer courts, or however it's pronounced, and they drop the charges, basically, if you have this letter. Um, one of the people was asked, like, should we write these Purcell shine letters for people? Uh, one person named Victor Brack, he was a, a Nazi, and he requested a Purcell shine letter from one of his victims. It was a guy that had gone to a Gestapo prison for his opposition to the euthanasia measures. And the guy's wife, in response to Brack, wrote, one day a letter from Brack's attorney arrived for my husband. Could he write a statement exonerating Brack? I only know that my husband spent three sleepless nights before he answered the letter. He wrote the lawyer that unfortunately this would be impossible, for Brack was informed about the matter in every respect. He had even been the particularly involved in silencing Braun, the guy's name, through the arrest, and Braun could not write an exonerating testimony here. So this was very much a, a, an opportunity for victims to get back at the oppressors by m guaranteeing that they see justice. It's a phenomenally good idea, in my opinion, this personal shine thing. I love it. I love everything about it. But another person, Dietrich Goldschmidt, said the denazification procedure was that now everyone had to prove I wasn't a Nazi. That is a false, that, I'm sorry, that is as false psychologically as it is understandable. For it compelled each person to show that he had been a not, that he hadn't been a Nazi at all. Then people wrote the so called personal shine for each other. For example, I was in Go uh, Gotengin, I think. And one of the directors of the firm for which I'd worked in the camp wrote to me whether I could write a personal shine for him, that he hadn't done anything to me, to which I wrote him back, how was that, please? Indeed, you didn't do anything to me, but do you hold that to have been a service, the basis of which you could now, so to speak, contribute to the reconstruction of this land? So he didn't receive that from me. My wife's former boss showed up in Gottingen, too. I think it's Gottingen, actually. Gottingen too, and wanted to have a certificate from her. She belittled him because he had been a party member. That was a big problem. Sent you some pronunciations on Discord. Okay, thank you so much, Rip Pumpkin J. I appreciate that. <laughs> I should have checked that a minute ago. It's Spruchkammer. That's the fricative that. <laughs> Spruchkammer. 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 Like that? <laughs> it's really hard to. Um, it's Spruchkammer. That's Spruchkammer. It's the fricative that. <laughs> Fricative. I love that. I'm going to remember that word forever. <laughs> it's really hard to um, explain that to somebody who doesn't speak a language with fricatives. That's really interesting. Spruchama, I think. Pazielschein. <laughs> oh, okay. Pazielschein. 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 Really hard to get, like, get rid of that back of the throat sound, you know? <laughs> Pazielschein. Pazielschein. Yeah, Pazielschein sounds like. It's very focused on the front of the mouth rather than like the throat. I think the city's called Göttingen. Göttingen. Okay, cool. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. So anyway, yeah, the, um, the Purcell shine. Is that how it was? I'm sorry, one more time. Pazil shine. Pazil shine, yeah. The Pazil shine letters were a phenomenal idea, though people complained about them. I think that that is one way in which we could absolutely denazify. Like if Trump supporters say, for example, um, Trump supporters show up and a bunch of people die. This is January 6th. Just imagine January 6th for a minute. Okay. A bunch of somebody died. A bunch of people died. There were people that were guilty there. Whether they actually participated or what is, I don't know. You know, that's up in the air to be de determined. But the Pazilshine letters would be flipping the burden of proof and making Trump supporters responsible to prove their innocence, prove that they didn't do anything questionable. They'd have to get letters from character references. They'd have to get character references from people in their life. 
And if somebody sent a negative character reference, it was it was over for them. You know, I don't know. Something's baking there. I'm not 100 percent sure that's a good idea. I'm not sure that it should work like that. But it's an interesting idea anyway to me. There's also um, I'm just looking through here. They had heresy uh, trials for the church. That's obviously more complicated and isn't really something that we can do in the United States with Trump supporters. Um, eventually, they left the denazifying process up to the church as long as it was well documented. They basically set quotas of how many pastors they're going to remove from the roles. And you could only be paid as a pastor if you were on the official roles as a pastor basically um you know you can get your like your congregation to donate to you or whatever but you couldn't have any kind of influence in anything at all unless you were on the voter or i'm sorry unless you were on the rolls like as a an official pastor an educated pastor that's passed tests to prove that you know what you're doing that kind of thing um also they were banned from talking about politics at all and anybody that was like determined to be part of the party even a little bit they fell into five categories that ranged anywhere from serious offenders who you know it warrants the death penalty all the way down to simply a party member that displayed some anti-nazi activities or di or took part in some anti-nazi activities five different levels and depending on which one you were you could either keep your job in public service or in the church or whatever, just depending. Anyway, yeah, um, the number one rule, though, nobody's allowed to talk about politics in the church. No politics. Uh, no race-based stuff, period. You want to talk about spirituality, religion, whatever? Go nuts. But make it about somebody other than the Jews and don't bring up race at all. Aside from all that, you know that Hitler didn't actually believe all that racial bullshit, right? I'll give you evidence for it. Evidence presented in my book that you have to uh, get if you want to read it. Going to be in audiobook form. Going to be in um, like written form on Amazon, Kindle, everywhere. Link in the description. I'm editing right now. Um, OwenMorgan.com. You can join my mailing list, and I will like send you like coupons for it and stuff discounts and things for it um hold on now let me just think about where i found this originally so i can pull this up it's in hitler's religious beliefs under the table talk section here this is what i write in my book fascinatingly table talk it's a big thing i don't need to get into it also reveals a conversation in which hitler said we speak of the jewish race only as a linguistic convenience for in the true sense of the word and from a genetic standpoint there is no jewish race the Jewish race is, above all, a community of the spirit. Anthropologically, the Jews do not exhibit those common characteristics that would identify them as a uniform race. A spiritual race is harder and more lasting than a natural race. That's interesting, huh? So he seemed to recognize he's completely full of shit from the bottom up. Uh, I just, yeah, this, this is going to be a super interesting book, honestly. I hope you guys get it. Tell me what you think in the comments.